Ready to visit the best mouse on the West Coast? Stay tuned to hear all about planning a Disneyland vacation. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. So welcome back from Disneyland. Yeah, it really is sometimes the happiest place on earth. There's something about it. it brings a smile to my face and it's quite a fun place to go well, for funny. vacation. It's funny that we're talking about planning a trip there today because all I can think is, you know, the the stress that can go into mm-hmm. planning sometimes um, for Disneyland. So it's just funny that like when you get there that it's the happiest place on earth because it seems it seems like a stressful thing. But I'm so glad, you know, the, Disney just really they do a magical job of making it so special for families. Yeah. And hopefully it'll come across in the podcast when we talk to Carissa. But planning a Disneyland vacation is so different than a Disney World vacation. So I think that especially you, since you haven't been to Disneyland and you're kind of on the East Coast, it's so different. I mean, when I hear and read articles and when I've been to Disney World, I just think to myself, wow, I mean, there's just it it is a stressful (laughs) undertaking. So (laughs) Disneyland, definitely kind of that West Coast chill. It's um, definitely different. So I'm excited to. Oh. Talk to Carissa about that. But yeah, my trip. So I got you just got back lucky. with yeah. Mia? Yeah, I went with Mia and we just did a little, it was about four days. So um, flew down there. That's the nice thing about living on the West Coast is a Disneyland vacation. It's pretty easy to get to. And um, yeah, so we flew down, took advantage of the Magical Express for the first time. We've done it once at Disney World. And so that's one thing that's a little different is at Disney World, it's part of staying on site. At Disney World, you get their Disney Magical Express. But in Disneyland, right. it's a separate company and a separate process. So you buy a ticket on it. And um, so that was kind of, I was glad to get experience that. And Is it just a bus that takes you from the airport and takes care of your luggage and everything, then brings you to the hotel? Right. Yeah. So you, it's just kind of, you know, like getting a shuttle, except for it's this great, you know, Greyhound b- bus that's got a great Disney wrap. So it's, um, ours was Buzz okay. the Ear. And um, so it it's kind of funny, though, because if you don't, they they make it very clear, like, this is what you're looking for. Because what you do is you leave the airport and you go and stand in the, um, kind of in the shuttle pickup area for... You know, just like you would take any sort mm-hmm. of airport transport shuttle. And there's these vans that come across that have these signs that say Disneyland Resort Express. I mean, they call themselves the exact same thing. And they hold up signs when they see, you know, I was the only oh, wow. mom and kid there. Yeah. So I kept thinking, no, they made it very clear that it would be a big bus. And these were like white vans. It was like Ajax Magical Vacation yeah. shuttle. And um so, but they're kind of, sne- it's kind of sneaky. So if you don't really know to look for that and know that, yes, it's going to be a big bus, you know, that's wrapped in the Disney characters, then it can kind of be a little, a little tricky. But yeah, so we, it's, it, you just stand over there, they come, put your bags underneath, you board the bus, and then a, they have like a ticketing agent that works at the stops and he takes your money or we had vouchers, but they take that from you and then you're on your way. And so we did it through, they do it through LAX or John Wayne. LAX is about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. And John Wayne, which is SNA, is a lot closer. I love the John Wayne airport, but LAX was the cheapest and that's where we went in and out of. So, but it worked smoothly. It was nice. Where did you guys stay? We were staying at the Disneyland Hotel, which was a first for us. So um, we we're kind of excited about that. And it was remodeled probably about, hmm, I think it was going through a remodel when we first started going. So it's probably been almost seven years ago, uh, six or seven years ago that it was remodeled. And so it kind of has these cool buildings that are blue glassed on the outside you can't it doesn't look blue when you're inside but the tinting on the windows is blue glass and um, looks really nice and we had a beautiful 11th floor room that looked over the big swimming pool area and kind of the hotel grounds so that was nice and um, the cool thing about the Disneyland Hotel is it's right at the end of 
the downtown Disney area. And so it's kind of fun to, you know, you leave the hotel and you walk through the whole downtown Disney district, which, again, it's a little different than what Disney Worlds is like, especially now that Disney World's going through that big Disney Springs experience, like changeover. But it's basically a long stretch of kind of an outdoor strip mall. But it feels kind of, okay. you know, Disney-fied. And at night, it's fun to leave the parks. I like leaving the parks at night because there's a lot of street performers um, that are kind of playing music and or singing and um, just fun things. So <clears throat> I feel like when we listened, when we did the episode with Leslie, that she was talking about like a secret way into Disney through one of the hotels. Is that the one? No, uh, that's actually the Grand Californian. And so... Uh, I typically think of the three hotels that the Paradise Pier is the farthest away. You used to be able, and I guess technically you still could, I don't know, you could cut through the Grand Californian, and that has a special entrance into California Adventure. So you end up kind of, um, you exit right into the Grizzly Peak area, which is by kind of in between Soren and Grizzly Grizzly River Rapids. So um, that's the one, and that's the craftsman architecture. It kind of... It's really woodsy looking and we've stayed there. It's it's beautiful, but it's definitely the highest tier. And then the mid tier, in my opinion, is the Disneyland Hotel. And um, their kind of claim to fame are these great monorail slides and their pool. And they also have the updated the rooms with these lighted headboards. And Mia just loved those because you'd flip a switch and they would have like LED um, fireworks up above and oh cute um, I, w- when uh, cinderella wish upon a dream i can't think of it right now <laughs> a wish is a dream your heart makes when you're fast asleep and that little a little tune would play and then you know it stops so that's kind of fun Aww. and then yeah and then paradise pier like i said it's farther away um because it's kind of across one of the a street but it has a view some of their you can pay for a view of Paradise Pier. So you have a view of kind of the almost like a fair is what Paradise Pier is like. There's, you know, the Mickey's Fun Wheel and the World okay. of Color Light Show and stuff. So you can pay for a view room there. So you can definitely get expensive rooms at all of the hotels. But yeah, so we we've stayed at all three now. So I was excited that now that I've stayed at the Disneyland Hotel, I kind of have a feel for all three of them. You're becoming an expert now. Yeah. Did you get to go to all the par- all the parks too then, I guess, if yep. you were there for a few days? Yeah. So we were there for, we actually had a four-day hopper they gave us. So um, we, it was a lot of fun. And it's nice, you know, going with one kid in a way because she was able to, her and Lizzie don't always agree on what they want to do. And I'm sure most families with multiple kids have that. And so it was nice that she could just say, I want to do this. I was like, okay, let's go. And there wasn't that, you know, bakery and that kind of, you have to go, okay, well, you're going to get to choose this time. And next time you get to choose and, you know, that sort of thing. So it was a lot of fun. We uh, met some great characters. She got to meet Spider-Man and Captain America and she got to meet Anna and Elsa. And we did Goofy's Kitchen for the first time, which is a character breakfast. So it's like a breakfast buffet. And then the characters come around to the table. So that one has basically the Fab Five. Um, actually it's not the Fab Five because they've got Mickey and Minnie and Goofy and Pluto, and then they have Chip and Dale. So, um, I didn't see Donald and Daisy, but that was fun. And that was at the Disneyland hotel. So that's kind of a good thing that if families are coming, like if they're leaving the parks one day and they don't want to pay for another park day hopper, they could do that breakfast to kind of get this character interaction. And, um, yeah, so it was definitely fun. She did California Screamin' for the first time, which is kind of what I consider probably one of their most intense roller coasters. Disney has a lot of, you know. Oh. Would, no, I said, oh, I, I thought oh, it was going to be the soaring over California uh, thing, not Screaming California. Yeah, so. California. Yep. California Screamin'. Um, so it was her first time doing that one, and it was a lot of fun. It's definitely, it goes upside down. You go in the loop that kind of makes the Paradise Pier. And so uh, she'd always been a little nervous about doing it. And I was quite okay with that because she's like my baby. And I think you're not big enough to do this, but it's not my favorite ride because I do get a little motion sickness. So I used my 
medicine and I went on it twice. I'm like, okay, I'll go on it once. And then the next day I went on it one more time with her and I'm like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> but she, uh, she got experience. Well, it's more than so. I would do. So you should get props for that. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, woohoo. So it was, but it's a, it, it really, it can go fast. It's fun. It's got a lot of G turns and stuff that really get you feeling like it's moving. So Anyway, so we did that. And then, as you say, Soren over California is actually changed. And I experienced this one for the first time in Disney World. And I wasn't sure if it had changed at California as well, but it has. It's called Soren over the world. And so it's now not California based. And you instead go through different spots around the world. That was one that I did when I was on the press trip in Disney World last June. So that was actually one ride that I really like yeah. because you just get to kind of, you know, dangle and watch the world go by. And um, I don't know, like I just closed my eyes if I got a little motion sick, but it was pretty, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I do okay on it. The Egypt is the worst uh, part of it for me with motion sickness is the Egypt one. It's the one that gets to me a little bit. So I don't know what it is about the camera angles and stuff, but that's the only one. Other ways I'm doing good. So, and it's fun to kind of talk to your kids about, oh, where's that? Where's that? And um, yeah. It's a fun, fun ride. So we had a great time and, you know, really it was there. We're reminiscing over preschool stuff because we were there kind of covering what there is for preschoolers and, you know, why we chose. Because we used to go a lot before even Mia was three and she was free. And um, then when they were in preschool, it's just there are some really great things about Disneyland. And so lots of fun reminiscing. Sounds like a fun trip. It was. It's good. And it now nice. Lizzie, Lizzie's going to be jealous and she'll get to go on the next trip, right? She's going on the next one, which should be later this month, I think. So um, just waiting on confirmation on that. But yeah, she I know Mia's gotten two in a row now. So <laughs> it's getting a little it's getting a little weird. She's so. gotten some good ones. She's too. got some She's good. the Dominican, the Nickelodeon, right? Yep. Yeah. Dominican Republic and the Nickelodeon Resort and now Disneyland. So yeah. Um, yeah, Lizzie did. Lizzie's going to be like, come me. on, mom. You I, took me. I know. Yeah, I was going to say, you took me on the boat, the long ferry boat ride. I mean, it sounded nice, but yep. it's not Disneyland. Exactly. Yeah. So, and it's getting harder with her, you know, because she could have come on this trip with us. Um, but because of she's in advanced math and she just had some stuff she didn't want to miss. And so it makes it a little harder. And with us planning a trip. Yeah, later this I hear month. you. So, yeah, nice. I hear you. Hannah is very much like she doesn't want to miss school. You know, she just is worried about getting behind yeah. and, and just having so much homework to make up. So it's it's true. Travel as much as you can when they're younger because it gets harder. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So but anyways, I'm excited to talk all about planning a Disneyland vacation because I think that um, it'll surprise people. I love, you know, one of the reasons we love Disneyland vacations is because it was more of a Southern California vacation and Disneyland was a big part of it. But when I go to Disney world, I feel like our whole week long vacation is kind of centered around Disney world. And I like that when we do Disneyland, we can do it for, you know, three days and then we have four other days to just do whatever we want. And that's really nice. So I'm excited to talk to Krissa about her tips and tricks for planning Disneyland vacations. Yeah, no, it's good. She's been like a gazillion times, so we'll get a lot of good stuff from her, I think. Great. Let's talk to Carissa. Okay, so we are here today with Carissa Houston. Carissa is a Disney-loving, homeschooling, clean-eating mom of two. She is a spontaneous traveler and a procrastinating writer. I think that's hysterical. When Carissa finally sits down to write, you can find her travel tales on All Day Mom. And she's also written a book called Disneyland on a Budget. And you can find that on Amazon. So welcome, Carissa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I did not know you were also a published author. Yeah, self-published, but I did write it, so I'm proud of it. Um, yeah, we, so one book so far and hopefully many, many more if I ever make myself sit down long enough and deal with it. <laughs> That's great. I know uh, you were someone that came to mind when we wanted to talk about Disneyland just because I see on Instagram, you, you are always posting about Disneyland. So I knew you were somewhat of an expert. Yeah, yeah. We go as often as we can. We usually spend at least a month out of each year in the parks um, and we've had annual passes for about 10 years. So we go a lot for living so far away. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and you guys, where you live and your family and all of that and how many Disneyland sure. vacations you've taken? Okay. Um, well, we live in Phoenix now. We've moved to Phoenix three years ago from Central California, and I'm married, and I have a 13-year-old son. Well, he'll be 13 next week, and a 10-year-old daughter. And I grew up in Southern California, so going to Disneyland all the time, of course. And then we lived in Central California for about 15 years before we moved here. And um, uh, we've gone to Disneyland at least 190 days since the kids were small. And so I don't know with trips, it probably ends up about 90 trips because sometimes I would take day trips with the kids and then um, family vacations, you know, three or four or five days, you know, every month or so. So, yeah, we've been there often. (laughs) Wow. I feel like I'm pretty comfortable with the parks, but wow, I... I I would be amazed to follow along in your footsteps and see how you how you tackle them. So, yeah, it's it's like we know it like the back of our hand. It's the kids home away from home, so they feel super comfortable there. Um, too comfortable, like they think they can wander off a little bit, and um, they're big enough now they can. But in the old days, you know, when they're three and five and they're just taking off, knowing where they want to go and getting lost in the crowd, that was a little hard. <laughs> yeah. That would be a little worrisome. So I'm, you know, being from the East Coast, I feel like, you know, I haven't been to Disneyland, but I have been to Disney World. And it's such a intimidating thing to start to plan a trip, especially if you're not so experienced. So when it comes to Disneyland, how far in advance do you recommend starting your planning process? Um, Well, I wouldn't bother planning anything any farther out than a month, really. I personally usually do it about two weeks in advance because I know I have my pattern. I can get the whole trip planned in about eight minutes. Um, And so it doesn't take me long, but if you never started before, it still should not take you more than an hour. And um, so it's not the same deal with with like trying to find uh, like hotel reservations or restaurant reservations six months in advance, like like you do at Disney World. No. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons we've never gone to Disney World is because I sit down and people are like, oh, I'm hitting my 180 days and I have my alarm set for like the time of the morning when they open and they have all their list of everything they want to do. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't even know where I'm going to live in 180 days. <laughs> so it's really, really different from Disney World planning. Yeah, I it's do. Good to know. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I've been to both and Disneyland, I would consider our home park because we are West Coasters and I love it. And I love the park for that simplicity of that. Although I do, I do think that especially if you're traveling during busy times and you want to stay on site, you know, booking a little more in advance is always kind of a good idea because there are only the three on site hotels. Um, mm-hmm. But they, they do drive in such a local audience that the hotels don't book like, Disney World because they do rely on a lot of annual pass holders and a lot of locals. So yeah, something to consider. You can often get better deals on the um, on-site hotels closer to your trip anyway, because if they haven't been filled up, then they will do special offers. Like right now they have a 25% off special offer, like through, I think the beginning of March before spring break hits, um, just to fill those rooms between now and then that's, it's not really a dead time because they have the run Disney and they have president's day, you know, so, but there's pockets like the Sunday through Thursday, you can get a pretty good deal right now. But if you did book in advance, you can just cancel your reservation and rebook it. But sometimes they're nice and they'll let you adjust it. (laughs) Yeah, and there is the one, I think there's only the one restaurant, right? Blue Bayou is probably the only one that if you want a specific time or something along those lines. Or I guess the Plaza, the Plaza in Morning Trick. Do you know about that? Like that? Well, yeah, we've never done the Morning Trick because, I mean, usually if you are doing that, you might be staying on site anyway. You have early morning anyway, or you have your magic morning. So, you know, you're saving a few minutes and you'll rush through your meal to get that trick done. Um, just cause when we do character meals, we stay for a really long time. So for us, that wouldn't work out, but yeah. Um, if you really want to get a specific time, you can definitely make reservations just to feel better. But now they do charge you a fee if you're a no-show for your reg- reservation and you don't cancel in advance. Um, so since we'd like to do things more spontaneously, you know, if I decide I want to go ride Indiana Jones, instead of show up at the blue Bayou, I don't want to get charged. 
So we honestly never make reservations. We don't make reservations for Blue Bayou. We don't make them for Goofy's Kitchen. We have never, like I have made reservations and I've waited the exact same amount of time as (laughs) walk-ups over the years. So um, I know that people that go to Disney World, they can't wrap their heads around that sometimes. Or if you really want to be somewhere at a certain time and you know it for sure, then that's awesome. And they're really flexible too. If you come up and say, you know, my reservation's for 10, but I need to move it to noon. You know, they're usually fine with that. Um, But you can fly by the seat of your pants and still do anything you want to do. Yeah. That is the nice thing about Disneyland. So it's like, is that like the California, like chill kind of vibe, you know? <laughs> I guess it is. Maybe that's what it is, but it's, um, it's a small park and, um, the, you're not really there for the food. So even like the blue Bayou food, it's fine. It's good, but it's not like, oh my gosh, I'm going for the food. You're going so you can watch the people in the boats on pirates go by, you know, that's yeah. what you're there for. Yeah, yeah. And, um, so there it's more like you're, it's the ambiance. It's not so much like foodie you know, right. foodie food. So um, I don't know. If, is Walt Disney World more like restaurant oriented? Dining seems to be a huge thing around there, but I don't, I don't, I think it's more just experiential dining and people just wrap their heads around that. So okay. I'm not sure. Though. Yeah. So it's Disney. It seems like people are more there for the rides. So like we're as happy if we grab a corn dog as we are going to, you know, wine country Totoria for two hours. So, yeah. And those, those quick service carts certainly show that in the lines that you see in the popcorn and the corn dog carts. There are I huge, know. huge lines to get popcorn and corn dogs. <laughs> it is crazy sometimes. So going so back. If, yeah. If you can eat off track, you're better off. Yeah. <laughs> So going back to let's get into booking vacations and planning and everything. Do you typically like to book a package or individual pieces? Or do you have any favorite tips or providers that you like to use when booking a vacation? Yeah, um, I know some. I will say we do not book packages because we have always had the annual passes. Um, So what we would basically do be doing is just booking a hotel only reservation, which we do like with the on-site hotels or whatever, but um, we've never done like a tickets and hotel combo, which is basically what you're getting with the packages. So with that for Disneyland, you're not going to save any money bundling it. It's kind of like a McDonald's meal. Like when you order the number four, you're still getting the same price of the Big Mac and the fries and the Coke individually. So it's the same thing for the packages. Um, but you might get perks from one provider or another. So if you're going to stay on site, then buying a package is totally cool and you might get some cute stuff out of it. Um, I would say Getaway Today, I think is the best place and I would start there. So I would compare Getaway Today, which is just getawaytoday.com, Costco Travel, because everybody has Costco, and um, the resort itself and get apples to apples, like premium room to premium room or, you know, standard to standard. So you know exactly what you're getting on exactly the same dates and then just do the math and figure out what's better. So Disneyland will give you like the photo pass right now, I think with the package and Costco will also give you the free photo pass. And then Costco gives you like a $90 or so, you know, like it can go up and down depending on the length of your stay, but um, a gift card, like a Disney gift card back. But like, I just did it just for this to work it out for the same dates and all the same information, the cheapest by a few hundred dollars was getaway today. Even though they don't give you any perks, it still works out cheaper once the dust clears. So I would probably say that's what you would end up with. And they're a like licensed Disney ticket um, site. So they're not like shady or anything like that. Your tickets will definitely work and your hotel reservation will definitely be there. Yeah, I've heard good things about them from other people. Yeah, I just recommended them to a friend who was asking for Disneyland booking tips. So yeah. definitely a good one. So what about if people are going to manage, they're going to split everything up um, and they just want to try and get the best deal? Because the the question I get, it seems like the most often is, how do I get deals on my tickets? And um, I think everyone wants to know that. So do you have yeah, some tips well, with- on saving money for tickets? For sure. Obviously, if you're going to go more than twice in a year, and most people, if you're going to go and you're not local, you'll go for at least three days. Going twice for three days each is the same price basically as getting an annual pass. So you might as well do that. 
you might go again. You probably will go if you buy the annual pass. And then you also get the 10% off discount, you know, pretty much everywhere. So that is a way to save on tickets is, you know, the longer you go, the more days you go, the less it costs per day. Um, but you, if you're going by your budget, like, okay, I only have a thousand dollars to spend on tickets this year, then you're going to have to go with the tickets, you know, for a family of four that work out to less than 250 bucks a ticket and then plan your trip around that. Um, but for hotel stays, you're better off if you're not staying on site, booking directly with the hotel you want and then buying your tickets separately because then you can get, you know, your AAA discount or any other discount that the hotel's offering. Um, and you'll get rack rate pretty much with a small discount if you go through a travel booking site. Um, so you would save more money on your hotel if you book direct with those. But like I said, the on-site hotels, you'll get pretty much the same pricing. Um, but tickets... A really easy way to save 6% just right off the top of your tickets is to have an American Express Blue Cash Preferred card because that has 6% cash back up to $6,000 in groceries. So every store pretty much sells Disney gift cards now. So you just go buy however many Disney gift cards you need to pay for your tickets and you got 6% off right there. Like no extra work. <laughs> mm. And then you just pay for your tickets with the gift cards when you go to the park or you can even do it online. Um, so that's a really easy way to save some money right off the top. We have in Arizona a fuel po points program through Kroger and probably most Kroger stores have that. So we actually save another 7% off the Disney gift cards when we buy it. So we're always saving at least 13% um, just just from buying Disney gift cards. And it's not very complicated. Um, so to do it that way is easier. Um, some sites like right now, Getaway Today, and some other sites like, um, I don't know how to say, is it A-Res Travel? They are offering the old prices for the Disney tickets, like the uh, park hoppers and everything, because the prices just went up this week. So you, if you want to buy them now, that's a good idea before they run out of um, giving you the old pricing. So you could save a couple hundred dollars if you're taking a long trip, you know, for your family right now. Yeah, they do that. Those it's, are great tips. Yeah, and it's good to know that February is the February is the month repeatedly when they raise ticket prices. So yeah, and they don't expire until you use them for the first day, right? Um, so. Well, they will now, I guess. Um, I guess that used to be the old system. And so now if you start, I think if you buy the old tickets, I'm not sure how it's going to work with the crossover, but from here on out, it's supposed to expire basically the end of the year. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Or, you know, if it's close to December or, you know, November, it, it'll probably be pushed to the next year, but it's not like no expiration ever just show up three years later and use them. Okay, great. Yeah, it's good to know. Yeah, so they would still let you in, but you would just pay the difference. So if the prices went up by 30 bucks per ticket, you'd pay the extra 30 bucks per ticket at that point. But they're not going to just not let you use them at all. Tickets. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I definitely recommend uh, buying your tickets in advance online or whatever and using your gift cards to pay for them because I was just shocked at the lines out there at the ticket booths. Oh, yeah. And um, when we've just got like if we lapse and we have to go get our annual passes again or something, we'll go in the night before because they're open till park close anyway. So you can go in the night before, get everything done when nobody's in line and then yeah. you can just walk right in the next day um, if you're not able to do it ahead. But now it's so easy. You can combine your gift cards now so you don't have to sit there plugging in, you know, or getting somebody to plug them in for you. So you can just basically hand them, you know, one or two gift cards and be done. Um, but they're really fast. In the old days, when I would have tons of $25 gift cards and I would pay for like deluxe annual passes for four people and it only took like five minutes, you know, so it's not not too bad. But yes, I would avoid the ticket booths at park opening at all costs. Yeah. So let's talk about staying on site. You kind of mentioned um, booking it separately, but is there anything tips wise about staying on site versus off site or any favorite hotels that you'd like to recommend? Yeah. Um, We've stayed at the Disneyland Hotel and Grand California tons of times. And my kids love the Disneyland Hotel. That's their favorite. And they like the Grand Californian too. But really, it's about the pools for my kids. Um, and you cannot get them out of the pools to go into the parks. So some of that is because maybe they're spoiled with the parks and it's like old hat to them. And the pools are, you know, fewer and far between to get to go to the monorail slides and all that. But... I wouldn't, we don't ever book the on-site hotels when it's not swimming weather. 
Um, just because we know that when we do that, we will spend probably half of our day at least at the pools. So if your kids don't care about pools, I would be hard pressed to recommend staying on site just because the cost is huge. And the things that you can do when it's not necessarily swimming weather is like look at the trees and the decorations at Christmas time. And you can do that for free just walking into the hotels at any time. So there's no need to pay to stay at that hotel to see that stuff. Um, so to us, we have never booked like a Christmas time Grand Californian trip. It's always summer um, or October, which sounds cold, but it's always nice and hot. And kids will swim anytime. It's a heat. All of them are heated pools. But if I'm going to get in the water, it has to be at least like 80 degrees, 70 degrees at the very lowest. Um, so, but staying on site is fun. And there's not like... I guess there's something of Disney bubble that people talk about Walt Disney World. There's not really that at Disneyland. So it's in the middle of a city. <laughs> you just are. You can be on the rides and you can look out and you can see the convention center. You know, like you're in a city. There's no like magical bubble. So when you go from the Disneyland Hotel, you have to walk through downtown Disney, which is not really magical. It's just a mall to get into Disneyland. So if you're on Harbor, then you have to walk across the street and you see people at the bus stop and it's not really life ruining, you know? So it doesn't really matter where you stay because it's not, um, unless you're at the Disneyland hotel, it's not super, super Disney themed. So Disneyland hotel is fun and super themed. Um, we've never stayed at the paradise pier just because it's a higher price for about the same quality of hotel as you're getting on Harbor, but you do get extra magic hour, which means you get to go in an hour early every single day you're there, including the day you check in and the day you check out. So that is valuable, but it's not necessarily worth the value of a couple hundred dollars a night more for your family to me. I would not pay $40 a person, you know, just to get in an hour early every day. So Kim, you just stayed at which one? The Disneyland Hotel? Yeah. Yeah. I've stayed at all three actually. So We've um, paid and stayed at Paradise Pier with a Paradise Pier view room so we could watch World of Color kind of from our room and stuff. Um, and we've stayed at Grand Californian. And then, yeah, we were at Disneyland Hotel and my daughter was heartbroken because the monorail slides were closed for refurbishment. And it was so Ooh. cold. It was really cold and actually a rainy, um, some rain. So we didn't even go in the pool the whole trip. So that was a real bummer. Oh, no. We had a, a great view of it, but we didn't go in it. So. Yeah. Well, one good thing, which I don't know if it was cold, you wouldn't have anyway, but if they are refurbing one of the um, hotel pools on site, they will give you access to the other pools. Oh, so like right now, Grand California, Grand California, yeah, yeah, they're refurbing their pool right now, but the, the guests can go use the Disneyland hotel pool, Oh, which so means, you know, those are going to get more crowded, <laughs> you know, because you're using two hotels worth of people in one pool area. But, um, but that is nice. At least you're not just out of luck if you, you know, didn't know they were going to refurb it. Oh, so that wouldn't have even mattered for us because we would have been going for the slide at Grand Californian, but that wouldn't have yeah. been open either. So they've got both of them down. Yeah, the pools weren't busy, but like I said, it was like 50 Cold. degrees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, so we stayed at Disneyland Hotel. So of the three, yeah, I mean, it's it's just all different. I can see what you say. I, I do think that I like walking through downtown Disney um, and especially late at night. I love all the, you know, the street performers and singing the music and just kind of the atmosphere. It's a fun, it's a fun walk to me, but we've also stayed off site. We've stayed off site and driven and we've also stayed across the street and walked over. So I've, I've kind of done it all and there's definitely pros and cons, but I would say splurge if you have the extra money because staying on site, there's, I love the magic morning. I mean, we, we took advantage of that a couple of times and it's a big, big benefit, but if um, you need to save money, then there's nothing wrong with staying across Harbor, one of those right. motels. Cause they are motels. That's the one thing is you're not going to be in a, I guess there's like a Fairfield Inn or something that's kind of nicer, but. Yeah, that's one we haven't stayed at before, but um, as far as, you know, just having the Disneyland vacation. The only thing that I want people to know is if you stay at, you know, 
any hotel that won't give you bed bugs and go to Disneyland for one day, one park, don't even get the park <laughs> hopper, you will still have the time of your life. Mm-hmm. I get worried when people are like, oh, yes, you have to do the Disneyland hotel. You know, you have to stay four days. You have to eat here and there. And I'm like, it's not Disney World. It's designed to be amazing for like any length of time. Yep. And uh, even if you won't get on every ride, you can still just be immersed in it and see everything, you know, that you wanted to see, the things that were there when you were a kid, the things that, you know, are new to you. And you can get a lot done um, even in one day. So like, don't wait till you can save up $4,000, you know, to go for three days and stay at the Disneyland hotel. But yes, it's fun and it is super fun. And my kids will tell you hands down, that's their favorite hotel they've ever stayed at in their entire lives is Disneyland hotel. (laughs) So how many days do you think you should spend in Disneyland? I mean, obviously, I'm getting the impression that it's much smaller. You can probably do it in a couple of days. But what would you recommend? Um, If somebody has never been there before, I would say to go for three days at least would be ideal. Um, If you've really never been there and you want to, like, really get to know the park have the chance to ride every single ride. Make sure you see the fireworks and world of color. You know, you can't really do both up close. Um, Things like that. You need as long as you can go. They only sell you up to like a five day ticket if you're American, but you can just keep adding days or get a, you know, annual pass. It's not a big deal, but at least three days. um, And unless you have kids that are teenagers or super, super wired kids that never wear out. I would do one park per day instead of the park hoppers. And I would do Disneyland start with then California adventure and then Disneyland again with those three days, because you'll spend, if you don't know what you're doing, you'll spend a really a lot of your time of your day walking back and forth between the parks, not really knowing what you're headed for. And it can be a time suck. Like, you know, you'd be better off maybe staying five days for the one park a day than a three day park hopper. You'd probably see more and it would be about the same price. So three days, I think would make you feel like you'd really been there. Um, and you can stretch your vacation out. You can be at your hotel and stay there for a week. You don't have to go to Disneyland every single day. You know, your tickets are good for like, what, 14 days. So you can go to the beach one day. That's pretty much free. And you can go see everything in Hollywood. That's all free. You can, um, you know, drive up and down the coast. If you have a car, that's all free, you know, so you can do free things in between to really balance it out. That's good. Yeah. That's kind of, that's what I would say too. I think our first trips were three days and, you know, we like that. So. Definitely. But if you're, if you're, I would, I'll just make a little thing here. If you are going, it's definitely good to, if you're doing like a once in a lifetime trip, it almost would be worth it staying longer and going during a peak time and dealing with crowds. Because for instance, we went and it's off season. And of course the slides were down. Pirates of the Caribbean was down. The Matterhorn was down. Um, there was a couple more rides that were down, but you definitely, that off season, you know, that's when they put everything into refurbishment. So if you have some yeah. some rides you really care about, <laughs> then you definitely want to be mindful of that. Well, and the hours are shorter. And so you, it's never like you, you might feel like the park is less crowded, but you're right. Even though you know it's summer, you know everybody's off, you know everybody's going to be there. The, it, the people are spread out between more rides, like you said, because there's nothing on refurbishment. And then the park is open 16 hours instead of 12 hours, you know, so you have extra time and people poop out, you know, so you can ride all the rides at 10 o'clock at night and everybody's gone. But yes, you need to plan like first, like when can you go and then check the crowd forecast calendar is like the next thing I do on is it Do you guys use that at all? It'll tell you how busy it's going to be each day that they think, and it's always right. Like I've never been disappointed. And then you check the refurbishments list because like next week pirates is going to still be down. That is one of our favorite rides, but we know we'll be back. So we're not crying over it. But if it's like your favorite ride, you wrote it as a kid, you want to show your kids that, and they've never been on it. And then you get there and then find out it's closed and you're not going to be back for three or four years. You're going to be super upset. So where do they find the refurbishment list? Disney publishes that. They do. They don't usually publish an end date, but um, there's touring plans, which I think they have an app too, but it's they have a blog and they give, I don't know where they get their information from cast members or what, but they usually have 
end dates or when they think it's going to end, um, which is super helpful. So like, um, like while we're there next week where they, oh gosh, I can't even think of the name off this. We always call it the brother bear play place. That's why it's a um, Creek challenge. Yes. Thank you. My <laughs> daughter was really like 10 sad. years ago. Yeah, we still call it so brother sad. bear. But it will open three days into our trip. So we know like, okay, well, on Friday, we'll be able to go, you know, but pirates will be gone all the way to like the middle of March or something. So we know we don't need to keep looking at pirates to see, oh, did they open after all, you know, but we know like on Friday, we can show up and go to the Redwood Creek area. Um, So that helps us plan, you know, like. Like if we wanted Matterhorn to be open and we know it's going to open, you know, the next week, we might move our trip if we really wanted to write it, you know. So just whatever is important to you. Like, is it important for it not to be busy? Is it important to have big hours or fireworks? You know, fireworks are not always going on. Is it important for you to, that your kids don't miss school? Because really, if you want like the lowest crowds, you need to take them out of school. So do you have any tips for fast pass usage? And um, because I know they're there's going to be some changes coming up to Disneyland, but any tips on that for planning? How do you plan out fast passes? Yeah, well, um, they're going to try to do kind of a Disney World thing, kind of, I guess, which is going to be called Max Pass, or it's called that right now. And I, I want to see if they're doing any of it next week, but I don't think they'll be doing it yet. They weren't doing so, it yet when I was there, so yeah. Yeah, it's we are not super fans, but what it seems to be is you use the app and you pay $10 per person per day. So for a family of four, that's an extra $40 per day. And the benefits are you get photo pass downloads, which is a good thing. And you get um, to book your fast passes from your phone instead of walking over to the kiosks. So the biggest benefit of that would be that you could book, be in Disney California Adventure, and you could book Space Mountain in Disneyland from your phone instead of having to walk across. But you don't get to do it in advance. You have to be in the park already there to do it. And you don't get any extra fast passes. It's still limited by the time. So a fast pass is just a ticket you pull that'll say, come back at 1030. And you go back between 1030 and 1130 to the ride entrance and you give them your ticket and they let you go through a shorter line. And you can only get another fast pass like every couple hours or so. But if you're really fast, you could run back and forth between the two parks, you know, mm-hmm. and because you can get you can hold a fast pass at the same time from either park. And there's some that are sometimes disconnected. But the main thing is the major rides like Space Mountain, you know, um, Star Tours, things like that um, will have the fast pass and they're adding a couple. But um for us, it's not really going to be a value. We will not be doing it, except I might add one like to mine to get the fast pass downloads if that works. Because the language is a little bit unclear whether it's talking about only the ride fast pass photos, which are not very valuable because you can snap a picture yeah. on the screen. But if it includes everything from the photo pass photographers too, and I could just do one on my ticket for 10 bucks and get my photo pass downloads for free for the whole day, that would be a value to me. So they started that a little bit. They've got now, they've got banners across the top of all the ride photos that talk about, you put this number into your app to get the download. And it's it takes up quite a bit of the screen space now. So... So they're not as visible. Well, that makes sense. Because like when you go to Universal, oh my gosh, it's like the photo mafia. It's all scrambled. You can barely see your photo and they like will stop you. They don't let anybody take pictures. But Disneyland's always been really good about that. So it sounds like they're trying to get people to get more into it. So the more they offer that as like a perk with other things like the premium annual passes have it, you know, things like that, then people will upgrade to get that you know, as a benefit, because I have like, oh my gosh, 6,000 photos of the screens from all the rides, you know, (laughs) what am I going to do with them? But, um, so anything with photo pass is pretty fun. So I'll just quickly, we talked a little bit about dining, but are there any, you know, for planning any special meals like world of color or the phantasmic dessert? Do you have any tips on that? Yeah, they have um, several packages. They have, well, right now there's no Fantasmic, but yeah, they normally have that. But right now they have the Main Street Electrical Parade just came back temporarily. So we're excited to see that next week. But um, they have a 
electrical parade package now that's kind of like, well, the Fantasmic was just dessert, but you can go earlier in the day, it's the same day, and you can do a lunch or a dinner option at a certain place. I think it's Aladdin's Oasis right now. There might be a couple more. And um, you pay a slightly higher, I don't know, substantially higher, I guess, price (laughs) for a meal, which is good because you're going to have to eat anyway. And then you get preferred um, I would say preferred seating, but you're not going to sit down. It's preferred standing <laughs> for the parade. And so this is another thing to me that um, differs completely from Disney World. There's nothing you can do to convince me to ever get in line for a parade or Fantasmic or fireworks or anything before five minutes before it starts. <laughs> we never have. And we've always gotten great views. Um, we just stop a cast member will ask them will say can we get in here and they'll open the rope and let us in and we just stand wherever and we always can see um but there's people that will start like four hours five hours before and lay out their sweaters and their blankets and they'll miss their whole day of doing rides because they have to like hold their spot so to me there is like pretty much only the value of the food in that kind of situation because the preferred is you're literally across the way from the people that are not preferred but they're standing across from you and they didn't buy the lunch you know or the dinner package um they just happen to stand in about the same place as your viewing area and you're getting the same view so it's a little bit of a racket but a lot of people like to do it and um you know people like to do everything like especially like i've noticed people from australia they're coming for the long haul that's an expensive ticket and they're here for like weeks or months and they are going to do everything they're going to do like all the packages all the world of color the special seating the special dining and they want to experience everything and that is totally fine and fun Um, but you absolutely can still see all the shows all the parades anything with no planning Good. So, and before we wrap up, do you have any final tips about planning of a Disneyland vacation? Um, Well, really just relax. (laughs) Don't freak (laughs) out. It's just Disneyland. And it seems like it's a big thing and it is a lot of money, but you can't really mess it up. Um, As long as you do stay either on site or stay on a short list of Harbor Boulevard hotels that are directly across where you do not have to ever use a car or ever use the Disney parking, which is becoming more awful by the day. Basically, like you could show that up there at 730 in the morning and they might reroute your car all the way to the Toy Story parking lot, which is really far. And then you have to get a shuttle. So anything you can do to avoid parking at Disneyland, do it, which is, you know, I would not even take a hotel that got you shuttle service to Disneyland because if you have kids and strollers and, you know, when they want a nap, they want a nap like or need a nap like right then. If you can go five minutes over to Harbor Boulevard or five minutes over to the Disneyland Hotel, you are much better off when you have children. Um, So that's the main thing is you can't mess it up. Stay on Harbor just between like Catella and the freeway, basically, or um, stay on site. And then the other thing is um, because kids do need a break. I mean, I'm assuming everybody that's listening to you guys has kids. So before you take your break during the day to go give them a nap or a swim or whatever, get a second set of fast passes, get a set from each park. Um, so go get a Space Mountain fast pass or Star Tours if Space Mountain already ran out by like, you know, two or three. It doesn't usually, but and then go back to California Adventure and get another set of fast passes for that. Like I'll send my husband on with the kids and I'll go to both parks real quick and get the second set of fast passes. So the return times are in the evening, usually like six, you know, six or eight o'clock, whatever. And then we know when we're definitely need to be back in the parks. And we know that when we come back, even though it's completely crowded and you get kind of disoriented when you walk back into the madness, um, you know, there's at least two rides for sure that are big ticket, like e-ticket rides that you can ride um, no matter how busy it got. So the second set of fast passes before your break would be my best, like just planning your day advice. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not stressful. All you need to do is like figure out when you want to go double check like that there's nothing crazy going on like um there's going to be the princess half marathon when we're there next week there's nothing i can do about it it's my son's (laughs) birthday weekend so it is what it is we always go that weekend whether there's a race or not so it'll be really busy but we know it so we can plan ahead and then just book your hotel um and then I, I keep checking the hotel constantly. I'll check it up till three days before so I can cancel my other reservation if I find something better. But you just need a hotel and tickets and that's it. You just go. It's pretty fun. <laughs> cool. 
It is a great one. I think the fast pass is the best. Really understanding the fast passes, the fast pass rides and having a plan of action for that is the way to really optimize your time at Disneyland because it's very different than Disney World. And um, if you really want those e-ticket rides, you can just keep churning those things. I mean, we we churn them. We're ready. Like as soon as you get in early, if you stay on site, you spend an hour going on rides and you're in a fast pass line when they open at nine o'clock to grab some and you just keep going. So. Yeah, it, it is really helpful. But even if you never get a fast pass and you just like methodically go through the park, if you start on the Adventureland side instead of on the um, Tomorrowland side, mm-hmm. you'll get a lot more done and you'll yeah. walk a lot less. So for small kids and they can't usually ride some of the fast pass rides anyway, you can just kind of go clockwise around the park, which is what we used to do in the old days before fast passes <laughs> and um, just start in Adventureland and just work your way around the park and you will get a lot done. Even if you never wanted to deal with a fast pass or didn't know what it was, or, you know, it gave you a headache. So and, with, you know, small kids, it depends your kids, you know, some kids can't even walk very much. Some kids are troopers, so it's hard to know. Yeah. And if you do do late nights, it's always good to know that it's not that you have to be out of the park by the closing time. You have to be in a line by the closing time. We got into Radiator Springs Racer at 7.57. The park closed at 8, and we were in line at 7.57, and it was a 30-minute wait where it had been a yeah. 100 minutes the rest of the day. Interesting. So, yeah. That's a really good tip because people think, like, if it says, like, 70 minutes, they have to, like, subtract 70 minutes from closing time. Or, oh, that's closed. You know, you're right. You can get in right at closing, yeah. and you're in. Yeah, if you have older kids, um, that's a big, big benefit because we're like, okay, it's 7.57. What line are we going to get in? And then it's like, Radiator Springs, let's go. <laughs> that's great. That is so great. Yeah, my kids still can't close the park. I usually send them back to the hotel and I stay longer and ride rides by myself. <laughs> Single rider so, line. That's the other benefit there. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, yeah, Chris, so fun. much. We're going to ask you one final question that we ask all of our guests, and that's what do you like to wear when you travel? Or especially maybe what do you like to wear when, when you tour Disneyland? Oh, yeah. Well, I would say probably 50% of my clothes are Disney clothes, which is funny. I have a hard time finding clothes when I have to look like a grown up. So I have tons Mm -hmm. of Disney tops and Star Wars tops. And then I usually just wear jeans or whatever. Um, And then but the shoes are all that matters. So um, for me, I have kind of weird feet from wearing high heels too much when I was a teenager. (laughs) And so um, closed toed shoes kill my feet. So I wear reef flip flops always and I buy them. It's um, I buy them two at a time every year and I just keep turning them and I have to mark them so I don't mix the pairs up because I buy the same color, (laughs) the same style. And they're super squishy and they're narrow for my feet, which are narrow. And um, I can wear them all day with no problems um, in the parks. And then I alternate those with Disney vans, which my feet don't love as well. So I usually make it to look cute about, you know, till our afternoon break. And then I go back into the parks at night with my flip flops on. So but yeah, so vans and flip flops is what I wear in the parks. Cute. And I know I, I've seen lots of pictures of you with your uh, Star Wars shirts and other things, and they're they're great. Love them. Yeah, it's super fun. It's like the only place you can look goofy and not feel weird. <laughs> no pun intended there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Thank you so much for all your tips. I think this is really good information for people that have been to the parks before and for those that are planning their first trips. Oh, great. Well, thanks so much for having me. I love talking about Disneyland. So this is fun for me. And where can everyone check in with you if they want to see your own Disneyland adventures, especially next week? I guess yeah, which um, might have already happened by the time this airs, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I am at All Day Mom. That's my website, alldaymom.com. And there's a family travel button and just click the Disneyland. And um, if you just type in Disneyland on a budget resources, you can find links to all the um, the weird discounts and stuff that I do that makes it a little bit easier that are outlined in the book. And right now I'm taking a social media break, so I'm not going to really be on that. But you can always email me, which um, you can find the email on All Day Mom. Great. Well, thank you so much. Sounds like a great resource. Thank you. Thanks, Carissa. Thanks so much. It's nice to talk to you guys. Bye. It's now time for our tip of the week. And our tip this week is all about Disneyland. And it's mostly targeted towards, you know, new visitors or visitors who maybe have been before but haven't been recently. 
The security lines for the bag checks have now changed. And so instead of clearing the bag check security lines kind of near the turnstiles of the two parks in the kind of Esplanade area, now the security checks are out uh, side of downtown Disney. And that's to basically allow downtown Disney to be a secure location now. And I actually love this for a couple of reasons. When we were staying on site at Disneyland Hotel, Uh, It was nicely organized. We left the hotel and started to walk towards downtown Disney. And right there, the canopies were set up with the metal detectors and the bag check tables. So it went really smoothly. And then you're in downtown Disney and you're kind of, you can walk straight to the turnstiles. There's no more pausing. I always hated on vacations before where you'd get in to go to the parks and you'd be all excited and then you have to stop for this long lineup of bag checks. And you're just like, you're seeing the turnstiles. They're right there, but you can't get there. So I personally like this idea, and the second reason I love it is because there are a lot of great places to eat and shop and stroll around in downtown Disney, but because of the bag check, often we wouldn't, if we were going to park hop or something, we would not leave one park to go into downtown Disney to eat lunch or something. Instead, we would just eat in the park, but now that downtown Disney is a part of this, you can easily go into downtown Disney to grab a Jamba Juice or to get some beignets, whatever you want to do, and then go right back into the park. So definitely something to keep in mind is that the bag check now is at like Harbor and also at the edges of the hotels. So that way you know what to expect and you're not shocked. Cool. That's a good tip. Um, And I just wanted to remind everyone that you have one more week to register to win Kim's uh, Wanderlust travel planning toolkit. And the way that you do that is you go to vacationmavens.com backslash 044. And that will bring you to the uh, episode where we talked about our travel planning tips and about her new travel planner. And if you go down to the bottom and leave a comment, that'll register you to win a free copy. And it's been really fun to read through. We've asked people to just say where they're going, where they're going next. So it's been really fun to read through what some of those are. A lot of national parks and California. We've got Alaska and Greece and Switzerland and Italy and Uh, all kinds of fun places, Uh, France. And even Liz said that she's heading to Disneyland in San Diego this summer. So hopefully this episode will also be very helpful for you, Liz. Um, So go ahead and leave a comment. We're going to pull the winner on February 28th. So you have a few more days to do that. And stay tuned next week. We're going to be talking to Dan from Points with a Crew on ways to use points to score travel deals. So another great you know, travel hacking, travel points kind of episode. Be sure to stay tuned next week for that. And I am heading off to Panama City, Florida this weekend to experience their family-friendly Mardi Gras. So I'll be able to tell you about that too. That'll be fun to hear about Mardi Gras and family friendly. Seems like two things that don't go together. So I'll be excited to hear how they're doing that. I know. Apparently there is a pet parade. So I'm really kind of looking forward to that. That'll be cute. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. I'll look forward to the photos that you'll be sharing. Yep. Follow on Instagram. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for another week. And we hope to see you in quotation marks again next week. All right. Talk to you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 